Now then, East African states may see the highest growth of billionaires and millionaires over the next decade. That's according to Knight Frank. Now, most of that growth will be uh, concentrated in about six countries, according to their models, and that includes Rwanda and Ethiopia, which, by the way, is supposed to become East Africa's biggest economy, overtaking Kenya. Between them, those three countries are forecast to be home to at least 1,000 people with a net worth of over $10 million by 2026. Now, the 2017 World Report also points out that for these individuals, citizenship is a commodity that they can acquire much more easily. Privacy, on the other hand, is increasingly out of reach. I spoke to the report's editor, Andrew Shirley, a little earlier. Last year, high net worth individuals around the world spent almost two and a half billion US dollars buying new nationalities. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at some countries, for example, St. Kitts and Nevis in the Caribbean, the vast bulk of their economy is driven by selling passports. Yeah. So there's a lot of rich people who do want to you know, be based in other parts of the world. And you talked about nationalities. I don't think that's such a big issue at the moment because a lot of wealthy people see themselves as global rather than citizens of one particular country. So we're seeing the emergence of these safe havens. I mean, Auckland in New Zealand saw large rates of growth last year. People see New, Ze New Zealand as very safe mm -hmm. um, from some of the issues of affecting the world at the moment. But that's, that's particularly interesting. I mean, you're talking about countries that a lot of us probably wouldn't, you know, think about. They, they, they don't come to top of mind when you talk about stability. I mean, yes, New Zealand's stable, but you don't think about it and think, yeah, I would like to actually go to the country. Even Canada, for example. What's, what's the attraction here? What are the priorities that these high net worth individuals are looking for? I mean, whenever we've done research in the Wealth Report, personal safety for their families is very important. I mean, you don't generally read about too many terrorist attacks in Canada, in New Zealand, so that's high um, in people's priorities. But also these countries have been very, very welcoming. They've had, um, they've had systems that have made it quite easy for wealthy Chinese, for example, to set up um, businesses and homes in Canada. I mean, we've seen a lot of um, the Canadian property market being driven by overseas interest from the Chinese. Yeah, indeed. And uh, one of the other things that came out in the report as a ranking of the main things that concern these high net worth individuals. Political risk is right at the top, but there are also the other things that you would expect, um, the value of their assets, rising tax rates, um, the direction in which interest rates uh, are going as well. But just speaking of assets, where exactly do they invest? Yes, you're, you've made a ton of money, then what after that? Where do you invest your money? Where do you yeah. keep it? I mean, our surveys always show year on year that property um, it's one of the key areas they like to invest, which is obviously good for a company like Knight Frank. <laughs> um, but it's, the picture varies around the world. For example, um, Kenyan high net worth individuals tend to invest less in equities and those traditional sorts of um, investments than, say, for example, Americans or British people. Mm -hmm. um, the, average, the average across the world is about 25% of investment portfolios into equities. Um, in Ken Kenya at the moment, it's about 16 so the picture changes depending where you are on the world and how safe. So what's, what's the Kenyan um, um, asset allocation split? Uh, is, is real estate a huge chunk of it because of the returns that we've seen over the last, say, five, ten years? I mean, commercial real estate is getting on for about 30% of their asset portfolios. Mm. I think it's because it's seen as a tangible um, investment that people understand. Once you've got a building, you know that your building is there. It's not mm. going to disappear overnight. Right. Um, Mauritius. Let's talk about Mauritius. A lovely little island. But it, you pointed out that one of the reasons why it's, it's getting such a huge flood of high net worth individuals is apparently an attractive um, retirement destination as well. Mauritius has come under fire over the last, especially over the last two years, um, from um, tax advocates who say, look, you can't just keep running an economy um, with these sort of attractive tax rates and then say that you're going to start draining capital from other East African economies as a whole. And it's become a problem. They've had a dispute uh, on tax issues with India as well. Um, isn't that a risk to the amount, to, to the attractiveness of Mauritius as an island for these high net worth individuals? Mm -hmm. I think it's fair is what, um, what high net worth individuals are going to achieve. And obviously we now we're seeing the introduction of the common reporting standard, which is being adopted by more and more countries around the world. So it is much more difficult to hide your wealth um, in different places. I mean, we just saw in the news in Kenya the other day that um, Jersey is sending back some millions of shillings that uh, were, were deposited there. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to hide your money, it's going to be more difficult to do that. But there's other reasons why you want to, might want to put your money um, into offshore jurisdiction, 